There's a lot more latitude that's given to you as an owner. At a company, you're just a cog in a wheel, and a manager has a responsibility to put your ass on a chair from nine to five. This is Unemployable, the podcast for independent workers, freelancers, DAO contributors, and other self-employed folks who want to own their employment and become self-sovereign. We may work alone, but we can be unemployable together. Welcome to Unemployable University. I'm your host, Joshua Lapidus, and today we're talking about how to find work in Web3. The future of work is in Web3 and DAOs, and after listening to today's episode, you'll be better prepared for that future. Over the course of this episode, we cover what is Web3, what is a DAO, why DAOs are important to the future of work, how to find work in Web3, specifically in a DAO, what's it like working in a DAO, how to get paid in DAOs, and how to work for a DAO and still get great benefits. Jumping right into today's episode, I'm going to share my DAO story, and then we'll cover some of the Web3 lessons and strategies I've learned along the way. I'm also interested in hearing your feedback on what's been great, what's not been so great while working in Web3 and DAOs, and I'd like you to share your thoughts and reactions to this episode with me on Twitter using the hashtag UnemployablePod. And please don't forget to tag Opolis, where I'll be personally replying to all of those tweets. I don't think that my journey to Web3 is that dissimilar from many of you. There is no right way to get here other than that you got here at all. I had what feels like three full careers before arriving at where I am now. I worked at all levels of government, state, local, federal. Yeah, you, you could say I was a bureaucrat. I also worked in campaigns in the Democratic Party, mostly working against the Democratic Party. Moved to China where I taught English for two years and then lived in Tel Aviv for six months where I studied at a coding boot camp before moving back to the US to try to find a job in tech. I was unsuccessful and like most of us fell back on what we knew and I worked on the 2016 campaign cycle in Phoenix and then in St. Pete and then finishing in Montana, at which point I became a meandering Uber and Lyft driver, just floating through life. After driving for Uber and Lyft full time, I was finally offered a job to like come in and work at Lyft corporate doing business development because I have a background in sales, onboarding new drivers, doing driver growth and user acquisition. And after serving the company like faithfully for two and a half, three years, uh, Lyft turns around and says, your department can't exist on the books after the IPO. They say, you can go find another job at the company. You can fuck off. And at this time, I had started experimenting with cryptocurrencies and started getting involved in some of these forums online. And I, I met this guy, Tommy, at the same time that I was making this transition away from Lyft because, you know, non-competes and whatnot, and you don't want to violate any of that. But I, I came to this project, Chaser, you know, nights and weekends, and it was a group of drivers who were trying to build decentralized rideshare, which is one of my passions now. They were trying to build decentralized rideshare and they understood it from the driver's perspective, but they didn't understand it from the rideshare perspective or what it takes to run a rideshare company. And so this is where my expertise came in. And so I was basically brought on to consult and help with the white paper from the perspective of how to run a decentralized rideshare company. And it was through writing this that I discovered from people that I now consider some of my best friends to be incompetent at crypto. They're like, you understand rideshare very well, but you don't know crypto. So I took this Consensus Academy blockchain essentials course and learned. And the timing of the graduation from this Consensus Academy class with my final days at Lyft actually synced up perfectly. Instead of taking this desk job in San Francisco, my now close friend said, you should come work with us full-time at Consensus. So I got hired to do business development at Panvala, which is a team at Consensus. And what is considered one of the first DAOs that's still around. After doing that for about six months, the same thing happened. And I was given the opportunity to find another job at Consensus or leave with Panvala. I decided not to leave with Panvala and was looking for another job in the company. Was not able to find one. It was the beginning of COVID and hiring was not a priority for many companies. And instead of giving up and leaving the ecosystem, I was encouraged to go to ETH Denver to find another job. They said, no, you're, you're getting this Web3 thing. This is not just a job. This is a movement. This is a revolution. You're going to be able to find another role in the space. And that's why I always recommend people go to a conference because the people you meet are going to be important in your journey. 
So I go to ETH Denver and on my way, I get my Cobra packet where, so I'm paying $400 a month for my health insurance. I now lose my income and they say, you have the opportunity to pay $2,400 to keep your health insurance. This is like the line that I use so often. I can't believe I just stumbled over it. I walk around ETH Denver saying there has to be a Web3 solution to this. And everyone goes, yeah, you should go talk to Opolis. And the rest is kind of history. I started freelancing for Opolis for free, setting up meetings for the founder, John Paller. I started working with a couple DAOs via Bill Warren, who is our head of product at Peeps Democracy, where we then founded a pool party. He introduced me to DAO House, where I was a paladin and raid guild, where I was a hunter and also a metafactory. ETH Denver is also where I met the Meta Cartel folks for the first time at a party thrown at a venue called the Church of Lubinomics, which is still one of my favorite venues in Denver. Yeah, after a few months, PPP loans came through and I was able to start working at Opolis full time. And in that capacity at Opolis, I was able to start working with a lot of DAOs because everybody was having the same need. How do DAOs employ contributors? And Opolis solved that problem. And I was really enthusiastic about the role because I got to help so many people across so many different DAOs. That was the beginning of my Web3 journey. To answer the question, what is Web3? We have to cover what is Web1 and Web2. The easiest way to think of Web1 is read only, just kind of information on a page. Web2 is read and write. You can think apps, so Facebook, Twitter. Web3 is read, write, and own. So instead of log in with Google, it's log in with Ethereum. It's this crypto empowered ecosystem in which we own our own data. I often get asked, what are DAOs and how do they work? I think first we need to start with the definition. So DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. There are a lot of things out there that call themselves DAOs, and it's important to know which ones are actually DAOs and which ones are not. And you can find that in how they are structured, how they are different from companies. So in a company, let's just say an LLC, you have a board of directors, you have a list of people who are owners, and the owners are not often the employees and are not often the customers. Whereas with DAOs, and this is kind of the key point that's the difference between a DAO and a regular ass company is that the ownership of the entity or non-entity or smart contract is the members of the community. And the members of the community here are either employees or contributors to the DAO, stakeholders, investors, customers. Generally how DAOs work, it's not dissimilar to how companies work, except for the people who own the company are not generally the same people who operate the company. When people think about the future of work, they generally think about unlimited PTO or working from home, but we do that already. And so if we've been doing this for five, 10 years, it's not the future of work, it's the present of work. The future of work is DAOs because of ownership. In a company, there's usually a few people at the top who maybe they are investors, maybe they're the people who founded the project who own and have totalitarian decision-making over the direction of the company. With DAOs, there is still an ownership component, but it is significantly more distributed. So you're working with peers who are able to remove leadership, who is often you. We often get asked, why work in a DAO when you could just work in a company? And if you want to just sit in a cubicle or get your special work from home and just like slave away for the man, people who are making billions of dollars while you're getting basic comp and maybe some equity, you can do that. There's not this like distinction of, ooh, I want to work in DAOs. If there's an idea that you're passionate about or you find an open role in a DAO that's working on something that you care about, your skills are transferable. You can go work in that DAO, whether you're a product manager or in marketing or a web dev, back end, front end, whatever, you name it. All of these things are being developed by people who are passionate and have ownership over the things that they're doing. And the difference between a company and a DAO 
is that when you show up and you start earning shares in the DAO, you're becoming a decision maker. So it's not just top down. There's a CEO or some other C-suite folks who are making these decisions. DAOs do have leadership. And the key difference is that they can be removed by other members of the DAO. And, and I, I don't just mean ownership in the sense of like, you're an owner is like, it's like genuine ownership over the direction that you can go with, with your career, with your life, with the products that we're building that are part of this financial revolution that's completely changing the world. All right. So now that I've sold you on the possibility of following your dreams and working for yourself while working with other people in DAOs, where do you find these opportunities? There are a great number of people that you can learn from and ecosystems that you can start to find. Gitcoin DAO is a great place to start learning about all of the things that are in the ecosystem because of the way their grants functions work. So lots of projects that are seeking funding but don't want to use tokenomics will post a grant. And by paying attention to these Gitcoin rounds, you can find a great number of opportunities. There are bounty boards galore, some of which we will list here, of different places that you can find freelance work. The Opolis Employment Commons is a great place to find both the benefits, but also hundreds of freelancers who are working in and around these projects. And they are friendly. So come in, say hello, and say, hey, I'm this. And this could be a project manager, could be a designer. You say, I'm a designer. I'm looking for places that have design needs and they're everywhere. So between Twitter, some communities, Discord, going to conferences, the show notes from Unemployable University, there are a great number of resources at your disposal to find DAOs that are working on things that you care about and DAOs that have needs for your skills or people with your skills. So naturally, I do get asked, is my skill set in high demand? And the answer almost categorically is yes. This is a nascent industry that is growing rapidly, that VCs are dumping tons of money into, that projects overnight through crowdfunding are uh, discovering creative ways to extend the runway of their projects between DAOs, Web3 companies, Web2 to Web3 bridge companies like Consensus and Opolis and Chainlink and everyone's hiring. Blindfold, spin around, throw a dart, you'll find hundreds of opportunities across every category of like marketing, technical, non-technical skills, community managers, DevRel, artists, designers, like you name it. If it can be done using a keyboard, there is a need for it. One of the greatest needs, like one of the things that Opolis that we're seeing that is in the highest demand right now is actually like accountants, CPAs, people who are able to do books, maybe treasury management, a little bit of risk management. The deeper the pockets, the more there is the need for all of these different skills. At these conferences, I do meet students and students always ask like, are there internships and DAOs? And I think the answer is both yes and no. So internships and as I mentioned, I come from DC, which is famously known as the city of unpaid labor because there are so many unpaid internships. There is unpaid work to do in DAOs, and that's how everyone gets started. You show up, you raise your hand, you say, I can do this work. And very often, because of the both progressive and libertarian nature of most of the people who work in DAOs, people get paid at least a fair wage for what they're working on. Are you going to have a starting salary at the top? your first role in the ecosystem? Probably not. A lot of it's bounty specific, you know, a couple hundred dollars to do this, a couple thousand to do that, maybe join a sprint or two sprints. But for the most part, this space is pretty well compensated. And though there is not robust internship programs, a lot of the ecosystem actually functions along an apprenticeship style, or maybe fellowship is a good way to think about it, in which you are, maybe you're a developer who is pretty good at JavaScript, but you're not really there on Solidity, where you can actually become an apprentice and learn under somebody to, to improve your skills and kind of, and level up your coding game. 
One of the key differences between a Web 2 and Web 3 mindset is the zero sum game design versus the positive sum. So in the previous iteration, the dying version of capitalism, it's all scarcity based. I need to improve my skills and you don't need to improve yours because we're in direct competition with each other. But because of how nascent this industry is and how many trillions of dollars we have to go in market cap and market share in building this new internet, it's all positive sum. And almost everybody that I meet has the same mindset of the rising tide lifts all boats. And by helping you to improve your skills, I'm improving the skills of others in the ecosystem. And we are all going to benefit together. And that's one of the one of the mutualistic things that actually Opolis helps with the DAOs that we service. DAOs are not our customers. DAOs are our partners. And it's because there's a mutual relationship in when you contribute to a DAO, you're not becoming an employee of a DAO. You're becoming an employee of yourself, co-employed with Opolis. And so what is it like to work in DAO? It's not all rainbows and butterflies. There are some pros and there are some cons. One of my favorite aspects of working in the ecosystem in general is the freedom and flexibility and the lack of micromanagement. Instead of being time-based constraints of like be at your desk from nine to five, you really can set your own hours as long as you are getting the things that you need to get done. And there's not just a manager who's telling you this is what you need to get done. It's a group discussion with your peers, your fellow DAO members or shareholders of what is a reasonable timeline to achieve this goal. How long is this sprint going to be? What are we going to work on? What are the KPIs? So there's a lot of similarities, but because you as an individual contributor are a major stakeholder in the success and failure of the company, there's a lot more latitude that's given to you as an owner to make decisions on behalf of your time management. At a company, you're just a cog in a wheel and a manager has a responsibility to put your ass on a chair from nine to five. How does decision-making work in a DAO? Ineffectually, in a word, it's new and there's a lot of experimentation. One of the cool things about working in a DAO is you're actually participating in the meta of how decision-making is going to work in the future. And so you are basically a rat in your own experiment. It's not a great analogy, but it helps to help you picture it. We are all lab rats in experiments of what the future of work is going to look like. How do decisions work specifically? There's not one right answer to that other than the commonality is that it's not top down. I, a, a lot of DAOs handle decision making very differently, but the key factor is that there's not one person at the top who is making decisions on behalf of other people. Sometimes that can be a delegated right, but at the end of the day, that person can be removed via voting or consensus. Not all, sometimes that's not the best decision making process. DAOs are figuring that out as they go along and iterating on the process but it is leaps and bounds, a drastic improvement from how things used to be. Yeah, so working in DAOs can be lucrative. There is significantly less slippage and waste than in the corporate structures. And so more of that value is given directly to contributors rather than tied up in bureaucracy. So that's nice. How does it work on chain? Sometimes by consensus, there's a pot of money and the DAO members will vote to allocate it to you. Sometimes it's part of a regular comp plan and just maybe through one of our partners, Superfluid, you're having your pay streamed to you in real time to your address. And at the bottom of that, once the independent, the DAO contributor, the freelancer has received payment from whoever they're working for or with, they engage with Opolis in a co-employment relationship where we invoice them, you, for your paycheck. And we're able to process your crypto earnings through our payroll process and direct deposit cash into your personal bank account on the first and third Friday of every month. Buried in the how to join a DAO and how to get paid working in DAOs is the question about upfront costs. 
the old expression, you have to spend money to make money. Sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. It really depends on the DAO. So Raid Guild, for example, where I'm a hunter, the buy-in to join Raid Guild was one ETH. That is membership in the club, membership in the organization. Some DAOs, you show up and just start doing work. And then you're given your equivalent of like sweat equity. They call these sweat shares. So sometimes you can earn your membership shares in the DAO. Sometimes you have to put money up front. I think the biggest component here is that none of it should be a surprise. Almost all of these, especially if they are actually DAOs, will have public forums by which you can see like the publicly posted instructions on how to join the DAO, how to become a contributor of the DAO, how to request request funding, which is a proposal process by which you can get paid from the DAO. All of these should be very well documented. And if they are not well documented, I would either recommend not joining that DAO, or if you are a type of person who likes doing that, uh, showing up and saying, hey, your documentation sucks. Uh, I would like to get paid to do the documentation for your DAO. That works sometimes. So let's say that you have been sold on making the transition from web two to web three. You're like, yeah, this DAO thing sounds awesome. But Josh, how do I get paid? Is there, are there paychecks? How do I get health insurance? How's all that work? These are great questions. The ones that we've been thinking about for a, a long time. And so out in the metaverse, you're going to earn stable coins, ETH, native tokens, wh whatever it is that you've come to an agreement with the DAOs that you're contributing to on how to get paid. There are a great many of like our partners, other protocols out there on how to get money from that DAO treasury into your personal ETH address or maybe even your business bank account if you're freelancing. How do you process that compliantly and get a W-2 and access health insurance? And that's actually where Opolis comes in. That's why we exist. So what we do is we invoice your company. If you don't have one, we help you set one up. We invoice your company to create an expenditure on your corporate books. We take that crypto or cash, whatever, and we process it through our payroll processor to distribute funds to the government for the taxes that you owe and pay the premiums for the benefits that you've elected. And maybe you're contributing to an HSA or FSA or, or a 401k, all of which we talk about in other episodes. And then we deposit the net into your personal bank account on the first and third Friday of every month with pay stubs, which you can use as proof of employment to get a car loan or maybe underwritten for a mortgage on a house. And it's through this entire process that we're able to basically replicate how Web2 employment works, but in Web3 and making it so that you can contribute to DAOs compliantly without having to worry about it. Because one of the things that I like talking about the most, or one of the, rather one of the jokes that I like telling the most is with regards to Al Capone. And it makes sense that I would ask you here, are you familiar with Al Capone? And if you're a learned individual, you're going, yeah, I know who Al Capone is. He's responsible for a body count upwards of 400 people, racketeering, selling alcohol during the prohibition, lots of bad stuff, right? What did he go to jail for? It was not killing people. It was not selling alcohol. It was not prostitution. It was tax evasion. He was convicted for tax evasion, which kind of proves that as long as you're giving the government their cut, they'll let you do whatever you want. Not career advice. I don't recommend just going out and doing whatever and hoping the government only cares about their cut. But the bottom line here is that as long as you as an individual are paying your taxes and are compliant, the DAO you're contributing to should probably be fine. So one of, one of the most important things that comes up all the time is how much can you get paid? What are the pay bands like? Are they comparable to what it's like in Web2? And the answer is yes, and then some, because... In addition to being competitive salaries for whatever it is that you're working on, for reasons I've previously mentioned that there's significantly less bureaucratic waste in the management of a company, you also get significantly higher upside in equity. So a lot of these DAOs have tokens and a lot of these tokens are more liquid than what a pre-IPO startup would be able to offer. As a current, former, and future diplomat, this is an episode that I'm really excited to be sharing with all of you unemployables. I'd love to hear your reactions and thoughts. You can tweet at the show at Opolis with the hashtag unemployablepod. At Unemployable, 
I'll always be looking ahead to see what's on the horizon and bringing you top strategies for thriving in the new economy with freedom, flexibility, and peace of mind. I hope you got a lot out of this episode on working in Web3. If you like this episode, please leave us a rating or review on your favorite podcast player. Until next time, I'm your host, Joshua Lapidus, a founding steward of Opolis, co-founder of SporkDAO, Web3 employment revolutionary, and tenured professor here at Unemployable University. Deuces.